All right. So, hey, this is Brett Wood, Parker X. Um, we're doing a series of podcasts related to COVID-19 and what the back end of the stay at home may look like. Um, and wanted to talk to a couple of my friends, Kevin White from Walker Consultants and Robert Farron from the city of Columbus about what they're seeing and hearing about how the parking and mobility industry may adapt over the next few months and years. Um, so, Kevin, uh, Robert, uh, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having us. So, I mean, obviously we're, we're purely speculating here at this point, but, um, f- from your perspective, I mean, the one big question is, is when do we get to some level of new normal? Um, and, and that's really hard to answer and probably varies from place to place. But the other part of that is what does, what does the new normal look like in the short term? Where, where do we go, um, as an industry? Yeah, I can, uh, can kind of start that off, Brett. Um, you know, in, in Columbus, we're kind of looking at two different things. We're looking at, one, what do revenues look like? You know, when do things start getting back to normal? And, you know, we think they're the our employment centers um, are probably going to come back first. Yeah, I think we'll see revenue come back in our downtowns. But I think where we're really going to continue to get hit hard is in our entertainment districts and our, our restaurant and shopping districts where, uh, you know, people are just not going to be coming out in droves. And, and we're seeing that now from our revenue. We're seeing downtown uh, generate generate the large majority of our revenue in our meters. And, and we're down 85 percent. So, I mean, we're we're overall we're we're we've we've generally hit rock bottom. But we're seeing those variations even now where those shopping retail districts are at 95, 96 percent down. So that's kind of, you know, that's that's kind of looking at the revenue side. And and then just from a general sense, you know, we've got to we got to think a little bit differently about the curve. And we've always talked about that. But I think from a revenue generation standpoint, this really is is a kick in the pants for or for for at least our team and, and others to say, how do we look at monetizing the right of way a little bit differently so that um, if this happens again, if we go into a second or third wave, we still have, we still have, um, you know, at least some kind of revenue coming in. Right. I mean, th- th- this, this wave was obviously, you know, unexpected and, and hit us pretty quick. Um, but you're right. I think there are things we can learn um, that allow us to adapt. I mean, you look at some of the things that we've adapted, you know, across the country, the, the curbside pickup zones, the, the way we've adapted enforcement, um, and I think beyond just us, I think like the employment side of the industry will adapt as well. We won't see an entire uh, industry shut down. We'll see it phased in, in, a, in a slightly different pattern, which hopefully doesn't disrupt things as much. Um, so it's interesting. One of the things you said was, you know, the expectation that the office work comes back. And I, I think that's right. I mean, I think you'll see um, essential, the essential workforce expand and then office work, even if it's just 50 percent capacity coming back. And one of the things that I've been hearing a lot lately, you know, whether it's cities or universities, is obviously a lot of that's going to come back in single occupant vehicles uh, because people are just going to be afraid of carpooling, van pooling, transit, whatever it may be. Um, and so, you know, where you've lost revenue from a from a daily perspective, do, do you think maybe that that's recovered from an increase in single occupant vehicles on the road? Possibly. I, th- I think, you know, I've, I've, I've been hearing the same thing where, you know, people are not going to go jump on the bus or the train, um, even shared mobility devices, you know, people are going to want to control their environment for as much, as much of their trip, as much of their day as possible. So I think, 
I think that remains to be seen. I think, you know, May, May and June will be, I think, critical months for us because we're going to start seeing some of these bans be lifted. We're going to start seeing people get back to work and will we start to see the trends? I think that's, it's incumbent on us um, to be looking at the data, to be looking at our, our data management systems and, and seeing where those trends uh, lie. Cause um, I, I think now more than ever, our industry has access to that data um, and, and we shouldn't be um, unlike maybe previous years, you know, you know, fly in the dark. So, yeah. Yeah, good good points. Um, when we talk about, I mean, so so looking at the data, and we've been doing this. I mean, the three of us worked together um, in Columbus on your last strategic plan, you know, a year or so ago, and largely data driven, and began to look at you know opportunities at the curbside for for different things. I, my gut is that that begins to adapt here, right? Like we're going to have to keep doing that, but look at other opportunities along the curb. Um, you know, and the big the big movement before this was pick up drop off zones with Uber and Lyft. Um, but, but I think that changes, right? Like I think coming out of this, it's going to be pick up drop off, but, but e-commerce and goods and things like that. I mean, what, what does, what does your gut tell you that the data is going to indicate at the curb and how we have to change our practices there? I think the long-term horizon here is parking sessions. Those three hour sessions become less and less of our, of our overall revenue streams of the overall activity at the curb. And we see this general ramp up in pickups and drop offs of goods, materials, food. Um, I think we'll still see congestion. Just the congestion is not going to be people looking for our parking space. It's going to be folks looking for that spot to, you know, Uber Eats to drop off or pick up Amazon. Um, and, and, and we were already seeing that. I just think it's going to become more pronounced. And again, it's incumbent on cities to say, if you're losing revenue from typical parking sessions, how do you still monetize that curb for, for, for all these new uses? How do you still manage the congestion? Um, because then we'll, we'll continue to have unsafe pick up and drop off situations. And, and so there, there has to be some, we have to figure out the technology and the monitoring and assessment solutions to do that. Cause it's not as easy as putting a meter out on the street. So there, there has to be some kind of quick innovation, but you know, at a crisis is, is, I mean, I think generally is where these things happen. So um, it's going to take the industry as a whole to kind of brainstorm and figure out how, how we can, how we can move in that direction. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've heard of, uh, you know, I know in Las Vegas, they're doing a pilot right now looking at setting up LPR cameras and trying to, you know, uh, sort of monetize the, the pickup drop off area. So I think it's a combination of that. It's a combination of using mobile payment platforms. I know that some cities are actually using those and setting up kind of corporate fleet accounts and actually having, you know, folks that are making drop offs actually making those payments via those platforms. And I think in those cases, you're sort of dealing with that compliance issue. You know, when you have gig workers that are maybe working for Uber Eats and they're working for Grubhub, how do you get them to? use a mobile platform to pay for, you know, a curb session when it might last only five or six minutes, if that. One of the things I've been wondering about, and this, this idea popped into my head related to like the curbside pickup and drop off for restaurants, which we've seen pop up everywhere. Um, and, you know, the idea that maybe, maybe we could monetize the use of those. Um, and so if, if I ordered something from a local restaurant here in Charleston, tacked on a 50 cent charge on the back end of it for a curbside access fee, which doesn't seem too overwhelming to the consumer. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a eight minute transaction, five minute transaction that I'm there and the city gets 50 cents off of it. Um, and then I started thinking, well, but, but like a Grubhub, a DoorDash, one of those, why couldn't we do the same? Basically any, any transaction that you had that took place within a city limit we just put a transaction fee on it for a curbside access because they're accessing some curb. And so that takes away the need to actually monetize it through a meter or a smartphone because you're right, they're not going to do it. Um, I don't know how well they're going to be willing to partner with us on that, but but that may be one way to kind of skirt the the issue of monetization technology. The other one, and Robert, you, you've alluded to this, is enforcement of those. It's almost virtually impossible with a three-hour parking transaction there's at least one or two times that your parking enforcement officer is going to go by and, and check the validity of that with a 15 minute loading transaction. 
the odds are they're not going to go by and see it at all. So, you know, how do you, how do you move to an enforcement environment that, that can handle that? I mean, I, th- I think we need to start a more robust discussion with our legislature, with our respective government officials about e-ticketing. You know, I think, you know, we've, we've seen photo red work. Uh, we've seen e-tolling work on, on turnpikes and, and at least in the United States, there's not any big city, even small city that's really doing the e-ticketing. So I think if we can get there, if we can help the, help our elected officials understand that it's about safety and there, yes, there's absolutely a revenue generation component, but it's about safety. Um, and it's also about not having to hire a million people because you would have to put people at every corner and just start, start watching these things happen. So if we can, if we can move the needle on e-ticketing and, and then post-processing tickets, then I think we have the foundation to actually enforce this. I think airports get it, you know, air, um, it, there's, there's that closed environment where they can regulate who comes on and off property. We've seen them regulate TNCs really efficiently. I think the cities, it's just more challenging because it's, it's, it's that big open environment. So um, it's going to be a multi-prong. There's going to be legislation. There needs to be technology. Um, there needs to be a lot of um, operator relationships that, needs, that, that you know, the, the operator community is huge. Um, you know, it's not just on-demand food delivery. It's not just parcel delivery. It's your fine meat and cheeses and your beverage distributors. Right. And it's, it's one of the largest industries out there that um, you've got to onboard those fleets. You have to get good in, good good uh good vehicle information so it, it's it's a huge nut to crack again i think this is the time where we just absolutely have to do it right well, and another impetus to that is just you know we're talking about a pandemic right i mean anything that's going to automate enforcement anything that's going to reduce our physical contact with equipment with people out in the field i mean that's just another another reason why that makes a lot of sense yeah, I was just thinking the exact same thing like we've had conversations about once enforcement officers go back to work how do we how do we minimize uh, their contact with people? Well, automating things would be an ideal way to do it. Um, yeah. So I mean, and auto, I think one of the the I mean, from a legislation perspective, you know, you talk to elected officials. The idea of automating enforcement is that we're going to write every ticket, and we may, but it's not about writing every ticket. It's about improving the process and managing better. Um, and theoretically more tickets we write initially are going to lead to better behavior and compliance going forward. So um, what, what other aspects of like management and operations, you know, we, we've kind of hit the curve side, but from a parking and mobility perspective, I mean, what do you see changing coming out of this? What are, what are some of the things that are going to need to evolve and adapt? Yeah, I mean, um, what I would expect, to, like I said before, I mean, anything that's that's involving physical contact with people, you know, physical contact with equipment, I think that there's this interim period here of the next 12 to 18 months, perhaps before a major vaccine or a treatment comes on board, where people have this perception of, you know, a lack of safety. We've sort of broken their trust in the environment, so to speak. So, you know, are there ways that we can automate payment collection and go touchless and go contactless? You know, how do we think about, you know, the, the parking facilities that we're, we're offering to customers? Are people going to want to park in, in surface lots, for instance, and not want to engage in, a, in parking in a garage and touching, you know, elevators and going down a stairwell? So like back to Robert's point earlier, using data to figure out, you know, what that demand profile looks like. Uh, but but enforcement, I think collections, just engagement with customers in general, both you know in the field and on the back end too, as it comes you know, as it pertains to folks in the office got, asking questions about permits and, and getting their getting their questions answered from a customer service standpoint. Yeah, I mean, and today we have a lot of the technology to be able to do that. I mean, we, whether it's building command centers and automating off street parking facilities or mobile payment or contactless payment, I mean, that's there. And so I, I suppose it accelerates the need to implement those types of things um, going forward. Yeah. yeah absolutely. One of the other questions I guess I would have for Robert is, you know, what are your, I mean, your cleaning procedures, you know, even something like how do I clean my equipment? You know, how do, how do we clean our garages? You know, making sure that we're following those cleaning procedures, but then also advertising to the public that we're thinking about their public safety. We're doing all we can. I mean, it's going to be, 
incumbent on us to really market that so that people are going to want to come back to our downtowns and come into our facility. <laughs> And there's an overall question to be had about just just public infrastructure. And I, I was on another, I was on a webinar, and I think the meter was the fourth or fifth like most disgusting piece of public <laughs> infrastructure out there. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure the bus onboarding fare system is right up there with the subway, and the, and then the parks equipment or garage. Yeah, I think you know there's 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 cleaning procedures that need to take place. There's also just um, again, these 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 projects have probably been on the list, and now we we have this opportunity to really kickstart them. Is is talking about asset light? Are you starting mm -hmm. to see cities go to mobile pay only zones, um, taking out single space meters, putting in multi space meters? Um, yeah, I think that's something that we all need to start looking at because I think overall there's going to be a sensitivity to I don't want to touch things. Um, and we were already moving toward contactless payment. And I think the industry was starting to catch up to where a lot of your kind of mainstream mainstream retail establishments already were. I think this just fast tracked. So I think we need to be thinking about the infrastructure side of things and how do we leverage automated systems and mobile pay and LPR so that we, we just don't have that situation happen. Right. Uh, but the right. cleaning procedures are tough, right? I mean, we have, we have 4,500 single space meters. I was on a call earlier um, in one city said it would take like four days to go through all their infrastructure and clean it. It's that's not sustainable. Um, we got to think a little bit differently about how we deploy, how we deploy that infrastructure out in the right of way. Yeah. There's certainly an opportunity here, whatever your adoption rate of mobile pay was. I mean, there's certainly an opportunity here to really accelerate that adoption rate so that on the back end of it, people are like, Oh, it's I have used all these contact solutions. So I think that's a, a silver lining maybe here thinking about it that way. I mean, that may be the ultimate move of us to asset light, right? I mean, like asset light has been reducing equipment, but if we can get to a point where it's all mobile pay, it's completely contactless. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest things before all of this happened was kind of the move to the multi-app environment where um, – we didn't have Robert didn't have to select one vendor, right? It could be any vendor that goes through one one application platform. So people had their choice. So if Ohio State students had, you know, Park Mobile, for example, but somebody else had Passport, they could they could use it. So it's, um, I mean, we're getting to an environment where that I think that makes sense, and that that becomes a, an operating cost reduction for programs, which you know, as we're trying to recover revenue, is going to be critically important. Yeah. So that, that's, that's interesting. You know, from a staffing perspective, when we keep talking about automation and automation being a way to, to keep people from having to touch things and interact with people, um, that, what does that do to our staff? I mean, do we, do we begin to repurpose staff into other roles that are, that are customer service driven, that are, you know, data analytics driven, whatever that may be? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, th I think... Uh, you know, in one respect, automation helps us to to scale. You know, I think I've never worked in a parking operation where I looked around and said, I had too many officers, I had too many cashiers, I had too many meter reps. You know, I think that automation allows us to be more efficient and then really manage as big of an area as, as we probably should have been already. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. You know, repurposing staff, you know, we're – We've always tried to implement strategies in Columbus that moves people online. You know, you don't have to come down to the impound for that trip, but we still need the staff to, I mean, you can only automate things so much. So there, you know, the staff becomes more back house. Um, you start getting more data, uh, data management analysts on board. Um, so I think there's still a need there. Um, and, you know, I think even now as we do return to work, you know, we got to be thoughtful about how we bring those folks back. You know, we still have folks working, but we're, we're on rotations. We're in smaller groups. Uh, we have staggered schedules. So, you know, we, we got to think about really as demand dictates. So I think that's the big thing with parking. You know, someone could come down with a rule that says, hey, everyone needs to go back to work. I think for our industry, as much as probably certainly others, we got to make sure demand dictates our hours of operation, our staffing levels. I'm not putting people back in an office because they say put people back in an office. I'm going to put them back in our right. office when it's safe to do so and when demand dictates. And if we can do more of this online and virtual, if this has showed us anything, I'm busier now than I've ever been. I I, I joked earlier, I had lunch yesterday at three. And today I got off a call early because I wanted to get my you know peanut butter sandwich. 
before I got back to the office. Um, I'm busier than ever. I think we can be productive in these environments, and that's going to help too from a staffing and scheduling perspective. But um, the more you move things virtual, I think the better. Yeah, and that, that whole point about phasing is really a good one. I think that there's obviously we're starting to see essential workers back in the workforce, and I expect after that, you know, more of the traditional workers, office workers, and then you're going to start seeing, you know, folks that maybe are in different sectors. So there's going to be kind of this drip of different sectors kind of re-engaging with the economy, certainly events and travel, leisure, anything that's around, you know, hotels or, or tourism, that's going to kind of lag. So if there are particular parts of your city that are maybe heavy in some of those areas, maybe those areas are kind of lag behind, you know, say the downtown, which is more of your, your nine to five commuters, which we, you know, expect to see back in some regard here over the next uh, coming months as things reopen. Well, it's interesting. I mean, one of the conversations that that we've been having about that is is how do you incentivize obviously those people to come back to your facilities, right? One of the things that Kevin you said was kind of the cleanliness aspect of it. Um, there could be service amenities that you provide to people so that you know maybe maybe they they can get you know goods delivered, those types of things at their facility. But Robert, I mean, you're in an interesting spot because the city of Columbus doesn't really have off street parking. So in a traditional sense, are you really competing for those commuters to come back to your spaces because you manage, you know, a couple thousand on street spaces, but to Kevin's point in places like the, you know, the arena district, if you're not going to see demand come back anytime soon, right. Are you, do you, do you adapt policy and make those longer term competitively priced parking spaces for commuters who don't want to go into a garage? I think absolutely. I, th- I think, you know, we should have the flexibility and the tools to be able to do that. And again, you know, where we're seeing revenue now is in our downtown. It's in those longer parking sessions. So it is, it's folks who, for whatever reason, are not parking in the garage. They're parking on the street. We clearly don't need the turnover right now for businesses. So I think from an amenity and customer service standpoint is, you know, we need to be thoughtful um, on where where do we need that turnover? Where do we absolutely need that turnover? Maybe it's not a three hour or two hour. It's a thirty or fifteen minute meter. It's some kind of pick up and drop off zone. And then yeah, where where we have the availability, let's park as many folks as possible. Um, and you know, and and, and yeah, or places like the arena district where you're gonna have people telecommuting and then people not coming to the arena. I think there's opportunities from the off street perspective um, to really broaden their horizons there. Um, you know, and, and I don't know enough about, I don't know how monthly parking, I think what well, I've heard, I've read articles about, you know, people are keeping their monthly parking for a month or two, and now you're probably going to start seeing some degradation revenue there. Um, so how do off street operators provide incentives? And, you know, if there's wait lists, you know, reminding folks, look, if you get off this list, that's fine. But then when things come back, you know, you're probably not gonna have a space. And there, there's things like that, that you could probably entice folks to stay on board to at least keep, keep that bare minimum revenue going. And I've heard of actual restrictions in terms of, you know, certain people out in the office on certain days, and then you kind of flip-flop with other people. So I expect to see people maybe coming in a couple of days a week because they have that restriction. Like maybe they've just realized that like, they're efficient at working at home. And so how do you go to more daily transit usage as opposed to relying so much on the monthly. I mean, I think, I think operations that are nimble, that have technology in place and policies in place where they can be flexible are going to capitalize as much on this and try to get as much revenue back. And those that aren't are not going to be able to offer these types of services. And I think, again, it's just a reaffirmation that we need to put policies and implement infrastructure in a way that we can try to weather these kind of storms. And I don't think anyone ever planned for this kind of storm. But it's just, again, incumbent on us to be thinking about asset light, flexible policies. Well, and yeah, absolutely. All of the above. Um, Kevin, you, you bring up an interesting point, too, when you talk about, you know, staggered work weeks, remote working. Um, you know, in the TDM side of the world, we've been talking about that for some time as a measure of kind of getting people to defray some of the commute um, impacts on a, on a day-to-day basis, congestion, you know, just... Uh, pollution, those types of things. And lo and behold, we've been all working from home for two months. And if you've seen the pictures of, you know, like I I love the one in India where you can actually see, you know, the, the, the mountains now, instead of just the brown cloud uh, a a few feet in front of your face. And 
L.A. looks like a real city and not, you know, smog land again. Um, hopefully there's some ways that we can leverage some of these things to get back to business, but also reduce some of the cars that are on the road um, just to kind of save uh, some of the benefits we've seen over the past past few weeks, um, whether that's, you know, electrification of fleet or, or TDM or whatever it may be. I think there's some opportunities there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is probably the world's largest, you know, experiment on, on teleworking we probably have ever conducted, right? So I think the companies are probably getting a whole wealth of, of data right now as far as the money that they're saving and the ability to streamline processes and save on travel costs. It'll be really interesting to see where that shakes out and whether the business travel, you know, sector is going to take a hit too when people realize they can have virtual meetings and virtual conferences like IPMIs this year. I, I don't expect that to be you know, significant because I think there's a lot of value in face-to-face, but it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out for sure. Yeah, I think you'll end up seeing uh, a lot of the frivolous biv- business travel uh, go away. We'll, we'll be able to do a lot of what we've always been able to do through meetings like this, right? I mean, just 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 doing it. So, which I think Brooke is happy about that, but I'm I'm not really sure. She hadn't stabbed me yet, so you know that's good. Um, <laughs> um, well, guys, we are we are running up on time for the free Zoom meeting here, so uh, I'm too cheap to pay for the uh, upgraded version. Um, but I, I thank you for, for joining today. I, interesting topics. And I know we're going to be talking about this for, uh, weeks and months to come and, uh, appreciate you guys doing this today. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it, Brett. Thank you for listening to the Parker X podcast. We sincerely appreciate it and hope you are enjoying our content. Please remember to rate, review, comment, subscribe, and share. And follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. The following has been a production of Parker X.